Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you to everyone for connecting to the third public meeting for the committee to review EPA's 2022 draft formaldehyde assessment. Next slide, please. My name is Kate Guyton, and I'm a senior program officer here at the National Academies, and I'm also the director for this study. It is my great pleasure to warmly welcome all of you to this public meeting and to thank you for your participation. I also extend my special thanks to the committee members for their service and to our EPA sponsors for their support. I am also very grateful to our board director, Cliff Duke, and our National Academies team members, Liz Boyle, Anthony DePinto, Brenna Albin, and Darlene Gross. Next slide, please. To provide further context for today's meeting, this slide provides an overview of the consensus process and study timeline. We are here today for meeting three, which is part of the committee's information gathering activities. The committee will consider information from today's session and from any future information gathering activities as they develop their consensus report. Next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of today's open session agenda. The session will include a question and answer session with the study sponsor, EPA. Thereafter, at approximately 3.20 p.m., we will provide an opportunity for public comment. Comments will be invited from one speaker per organization with preference given to those individuals and organizations who have not previously addressed the committee. Each speaker will have a maximum time limit of three minutes to provide comments relevant to the committee's task. After the meeting, anyone who wishes to submit comments or written materials uh, that are relevant to the committee's charge should submit them via the National Academy's project page. Next slide, please. As a reminder to our committee members, invited speakers, and the audience, the National Academies are committed to the principles of diversity, integrity, civility, and respect in all of our activities. All forms of discrimination, harassment, and bullying are prohibited in any National Academies activity. This applies to all participants in all virtual and in-person settings in which the National Academies activities are conducted. We look to you to be a partner in this commitment by helping us to maintain a professional and cordial environment. Once again, thank you very much for joining the open session. I now would like to invite opening remarks from Jonathan Samet, our committee chair. Hi, everybody, and uh, oops, thank you. Hi, everybody, and welcome, uh, and uh, thank you for attending uh, this second um, in-person meeting of the committee to review EPA's 2022 draft formaldehyde assessment. This session is an information gathering activity of the committee. The committee's effort is being conducted under the auspices of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in response to requests from the US Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the committee has been asked if we can go on to the uh, next slide with our statement of task. Uh, has been asked to conduct a scientific review of EPA's draft document referred to as the Integrated Risk Information System, or IRIS, Toxicological Review of Formaldehyde and Appendices. The committee will assess whether EPA's draft document adequately and transparently evaluated the scientific literature, used appropriate methods to synthesize the current state of the science, and presented conclusions regarding the hazard identification analysis and dose response analysis of formaldehyde that are supported by the scientific evidence. The committee will not conduct its own hazard assessment of formaldehyde, nor will the committee address the broader aspects of the IRIS program. Next slide, please. Recommendations about the IRIS assessment will be prioritized as follows. Tier one, recommended revisions that are important for EPA to consider and address to improve critical scientific concepts, issues, or narrative in the assessment. Tier two, suggested revisions that are encouraged to strengthen or clarify the scientific concepts, 
issues or narrative in the assessment, but are not critical. Other factors such as agency practices and resources might need to be considered by EPA before undertaking the revisions. Tier three, considerations that might inform future evaluations of key science issues or inform development of future assessments. Today's open session is on the record and is being recorded. I would like to emphasize to everyone that this is an information gathering session and the committee has not completed its deliberations. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the National Academies. Once the committee's draft report is written, it must go through a rigorous peer review process as described earlier by the staff before it may be approved for release as a National Academies report. Therefore, observers who draw conclusions about the committee's work based on today's discussions will be doing so prematurely. Now, next, I'd like to ask the uh, committee members to introduce themselves to the audience and indicate their affiliations. Um, I'm John Samet, Dean and Professor at the Colorado School of Public Health, and I'll go down my list of names just to simplify uh, things. So, Aisha. Hi, Aisha Dickerson, Assistant Professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dana. Hello, Dana Dolanoy, Professor and Chair of Environmental Health Sciences at University of Michigan School of Public Health. Dave? Dave Dorman, North Carolina State University. Rakesh? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Rakesh Koch from the University of California at San Francisco. Sabina? Sabina Lang, Chief Toxicologist at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Andy? Uh, Andy Olshan, Professor of Epidemiology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Ivan? Ivan Rusin, I'm Professor of Toxicology at Texas A&M University. Leanne? Uh, Leanne Shepard, Professor of Biostatistics and Environmental Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington School of Public Health. Gotcha. Hi, uh, Kati Tsayun, Director of Evidence-Based Toxicology Collaboration at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Joe? Hey, uh, Joseph Wemels. I'm a professor of molecular epidemi epidemiology at the University of Southern California. Uh, Lauren. Good afternoon. Uh, Lauren Zeiss, Director of the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment within the California Environmental Protection Agency. Ilion. Ilion. Hi, Ilion Zhu. I'm a Chief and Professor of Division of Epidemiology, Biostats, and Preventive Medicine, University of New Mexico School of Medicine. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, now we'll turn to our EPA attendees to uh, introduce yeah. themselves. And, and from the outset, I'd like to thank you for a very detailed response to the questions that the uh, committee uh, sent your way. You certainly provided a very comprehensive uh, response to our uh, questions and it was very uh, helpful. So let me turn to you for introductions. My name is Chris Thayer. I'm director of the Chemical and Pollutant Assessment Division at US EPA's Office of Research and Development. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Kraft. I'm one of the co-chemical managers on the iris formaldehyde assessment. I'm also Chris's associate in CPAT. Hi, I'm Tom Bateson. I'm an epidemiologist and the co-chemical manager of formaldehyde. Hi, I'm Samantha Jones, and I'm the associate director for assessment science in our Center for Public Health and Environmental Assessment in ORD EPA, which houses the uh, division and the iris program. Great, thanks, and uh, thank you for coming. And if I understand correctly, do you have any presentation materials that you want to use, or if I understand right, we'll perhaps engage in a discussion, and I don't know whether you want to make any further introductory remarks to the materials you sent, or we can just get right into it. Uh, Andrew, I'll leave it up to you. Yeah, whatever your preference is, if you'd like us to introduce our responses before the discussion, we can do so. If we just want to clarify responses, we can do it that way, whatever. So sure. if you want to make a, uh, an intro and then we'll go into discussion, that'd be just great. Um, so yeah, we rec received the questions from that NASM panel and thank you for those questions. There were four questions, uh, some of which had some part, subparts, so we answered them individually. I think question one, we interpreted 
uh, that to have an overarching question and then three sub questions. So we answer those individually. Uh, we provide those written responses as requested by NASM. Um, we can introduce going question by question if you'd like, and maybe use that um, as a presentation material, or we can answer clarifying questions. I, when I'm introduced, I meant like one by one. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we I, I, we we've had some discussion, and I, I know we have some things that we want to talk about. We could perhaps then go back um, through the document, the structure of the questions, to see if there are key issues perhaps have not um, touched on. And again, I'll just. Uh, repeat what I said that I know you put a lot of work into those uh, <laughs> responses and I think um, many things became clear and, and we do recognize that um, that that over the time during which assessment was done that there was an evolution of uh, approaches that the agency was taking but let me turn to the um, committee and um, please uh, I know some of you have uh, questions uh, to lead off with. Leanne? Yeah, so this is Leanne Shepard. Um, I was interested in hearing a little bit more from you about your study evaluation review process, um, aspects like the uh, roles and timing of the primary versus the secondary reviewer, uh, blinding, and uh, consistency over time within health help an end point. I know to note that this process has been going on for a long time. So I imagine there's been some staff turnover and I was interested in just hearing some more details about that. Sure, maybe I can start on the actual process for the study evaluations and then if others wanna jump in. Um, so yeah, for our study evaluations, we had uh, two experts review each study. We had a primary and secondary reviewer. Most of these uh, reviews, the time frame we're conducting these reviews is probably 2013 to 2016 time frame. So we were still evolving our systematic review pro uh, processes within the IRIS program. Um, the primary reviewer was, was the initial reviewer and the secondary reviewer kind of went behind the prior review and conducted their own analysis of the study and then checked uh, the, the information that was provided by the primary reviewer. They were not completely independent at this time. We didn't have the software tools that we have now to allow for complete independence of those reviewers. So the secondary reviewer was not blinded to the primary reviewer's decisions, which I think is what you're asking um, across those domains. Consistency, why we did have a team of uh, topic-specific discipline experts. So we had the same domains for uh, studies evaluated within a discipline. So epi studies had the same domains evaluated across health effects. Experimental animal studies had the same domains evaluated across health effects, controlled human exposure, and uh, studies had the same domains evaluated across health effects to allow for that consistency. Um, and then we also had our discipline-specific experts talk across health effects. So the epidemiologists that worked on asthma, for example, would talk to the epidemiologists that worked on pulmonary function, and they would review each other's uh, decisions to make sure there was consistency in that manner across health effects. Um, Am I missing any components of that that others want to chime in on? And there was kind of check-in, I believe, in terms of assessing potential drift. Over time, yes, that's the other thing I asked, right. So we did have turnover in the team, obviously, over uh, the long time frame. Um, there was consistency in some members. And so um, within discipline, we had that uh, kind of carryover of some members retain, being participant throughout the whole process of the formaldehyde development system. So the all, all 10 years, there's some members that have been there the whole time, including Tom and myself, um, as well as we did have disciplinary work group reviews of our sessions. So within the IRIS program, we, we have, I think at the time there were seven different uh, IRIS disciplinary work groups. So epidemiology, uh, inhalation toxicology, um, cancer, tox pathways, nervous system effects, developmental effects, repro effects, uh, and a couple of PPBK and uh, quantitative methods. And so they also reviewed the different parts of the draft assessment that were pertinent to their disciplines. Um, so in that way, we ensured some, these are independent from the team members. We ensured some consistency in, in application across uh, across the assessment by using those display work groups. Well, thank you. I guess I'll keep going. And and uh, just to clarify, I think I remember this in the document. By domains, you mean uh, categories like uh, selection and uh, confounding and so on, right? Okay, just want to make sure. Um, so 
can you just clarify? I, I think I, I kind of know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you. Um, the use of hawk in the formaldehyde process and um, was it used for any of the study evaluations? No, we did not use hawk for any of the study evaluations from aldehyde. That was a tool that was developed after the formaldehyde assessment was suspended um, in 2017. We did, however, use hawk for the systematic evidence map uh, when we updated the literature um, after 2017, when it was unsuspended in 2021, we did use hawk um, for the literature tree diagrams, things like that. We didn't um, use it for the study evaluations though. Let's see, I had one more on my list. Um, there was, I think on page 21 of the response, there was mention of a standardized template for uh, documenting and presenting decision steps. And I was wondering if it was possible for us to see an example of that. Sorry, I'm just trying to get to the page. <laughs> I think it's the second bullet in response to 1C. Right, that was a template table for the study evaluation tables in Appendix A5. So there was a template table that was shared across, um, within discipline across topic specific experts that they used to fill in the responses within domain for their particular health effect. I think that's one of the things. There were also template um, evidence tables within the main draft. So we tried to have consistency in kind of the format of the evidence tables to the extent possible. Uh, across health effect systems, also the the um, some of the figures had some some templates that we were sharing. So, is, so you're saying the templates are already in the appendix? Is that what you're saying? I'm just trying to read. I just trying to make sure I fully understand. Yeah, it was a template version of the table that was then shared with the other experts within uh, on the team. Can you give an example of a table number or not necessarily right this minute? I mean, you can sure. send it to us later just so that we fully understand that. That would be really sure. helpful. And I want to say, although I did spend a long plane ride yesterday reading this uh, detailed document, I, I also wanted to echo what John said, that it was very thorough and helpful. Thank you. Let's see. Leon, you had your hand up. Is it still up? Yeah, just a quick follow-up question that is, when the primary and the second reviews have uh, difference in opinion and judgment, how would you reconcile um, the differences? Yeah, so- What's the process? Sorry, consistent with our current uh, practice as well. First, there'd be a discussion amongst those two reviewers, and then if they couldn't come to resolution, we would bring in a third domain or discipline-specific expert. Thank you. So um, I don't know, this might put you on the spot a little bit. This wasn't in the document, but uh, if you were going to start over again, what would you do now that you, uh, um, that it will, like, what do you know better now that that uh, you would bring into this? Or maybe, uh, maybe in some sense that's answered because you already have your new handbook and you're following all those procedures. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the software tools make a huge difference. Using Hawk uh, from the beginning would have made things a lot easier. It makes the documentation a lot more easily transparent. You know, have these lengthy tables that take up, you know, a lot of pages. Uh, so for sure, we'd use the software tools. <laughs> Looking around, this is um, maybe... Um... One of the issues that came up as we were talking for the, I think it was the allergy and immune endpoints for which you uh, brought in sort of panels of experts. Can you just describe what you did, what the process was, how you identified the individuals, how you used their um, input. I think that was the only outcome for which you did that, if I'm correct. Yes, that's correct. So we didn't have um, a lot of expertise in that specific area which were allergy and asthma um, conditions from the epi studies. And so this is one of those situations where you have had some turnover and the people that actually wrote that section uh, have retired, since retired. 
but we did, um, and I can I can go back and get more details in the actual process for recruitment, which I don't have handy, uh, but we did work through a contract to do that. Um, but we recruited five experts specifically on allergy and then five experts specifically on asthma. There was one laughing expert between those two panels that were consulted on um, the types of studies that were available, the types of outcomes that they were looking at and how to talk about those outcomes, how to evaluate those outcomes. And that led to um, some of the criteria that were applied in the evaluation of those individual studies based on those panel recommendations with those discussions with those experts. I think there were two or three calls, but I'd have to look back for the details on the, the process for that since I didn't lead that myself. Right. Do you know what? A general question, like during the study quality evaluations, they're in different tiers, like considered to be say high quality, medium quality, et cetera. But can you speak to whether there was details for how to differentiate between say within a domain, what would be considered a high or moderate or low? Is there always, was there always like some criteria that was explicitly stated for that? Or was that a judgment call? How, how did that work out? <clears throat> So for some of them, there are explicit, you know, if you have this limitation, it will be a deficient, or I think we're calling it poor, sorry. So we had, within domain, it was good, adequate, poor, and then kind of critically deficient, if you would, um, within each domain, and then across the domains is the high, medium, low competence, or not informative. And for some of those, we did have explicit, you know, if you have this limitation, this will be for this outcome, a low confidence, but no, not for every domain, within every outcome, did we have, here's how you hit good, here's how you hit adequate, here's how you hit deficient within the domain. Sometimes that was an expert judgment based on, you know, this, the important things for this endpoint are X, Y, and Z. You know, if you didn't meet one of these, this is a downgrade. The severity of how you didn't meet that might take you from a, a good all the way down to a poor, for example. So no, not every time do we have, this is high, this is medium, this is low. Sometimes we did, but not for every domain. So just as a follow-up, would that have been documented somehow within your process? Because may or may not always have made it into the final report, correct? So there would be documentation of the specific deficiency itself um, within those study evaluation tables in Appendix A5. So A5.1 includes all of the specific evaluations of the controlled exposure studies. So there were seven domains for every controlled exposure study that were evaluated, and they each have the limitations limited within the domain that resulted in the determination of that domain, if you would, then A5-2, I think, is sensory irritation, A5-3, pulmonary function, et cetera. And within each of those appendices, there are uh, considerations for study evaluation that, that discuss in general uh, the important points for each health effect. And then within the tables, like, for example, the animal tables, and there's a header bar that includes the specific limitations that were most impactful to each domain decision. And then that's also documented within those specific tables for each study. Um, do you want to speak yeah. to cancer? So um, speaking to cancer, which is in A59, um, there's a detailed narrative of how each domain was um, reviewed, um, selection, uh, exposure, outcome, confounding analysis, and what were the important things that we were looking for to be either uh, positives or negatives. And those are laid out there in quite a bit of detail. Maybe a, a very general question I mean, one of the areas of course where systematic review methodology is still evolving uh, is around mechanistic considerations and can you you know there talk about the as you move forward in this assessment how you gathered and put together the mechanistic information I think just an overall description of of what you what you did during these years when perhaps the methods were not as far along as they might be now. And you're speaking more towards identifying it or the whole how process. you gathered the evidence, how you decided what was important and 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 put together your narratives. Sure. So formaldehyde's a little bit unique in that we had the NAS 2011 report to start from, and that really provided a pretty thorough roadmap as to um, what health effects were most important to consider, how to go about thinking about those, some of the considerations for evaluating those health effects. Um, and that really helped gear our literature searches, which were very health effect centric. So not all iris assessments are conducting individual health effects specific searches and more just by cast number or something like that. 
Um, so formaldehyde really used the NAS 2011 report as a, as a roadmap for what are the key issues uh, to narrow down that, that, that scope, if you would. And so within our uh, literature search design, we had not only mechanistic information collected as with some of the searches. So for example, for nervous system effects, for developmental and repro effects, those were, were designed to try and pull in mechanistic information on those health outcomes. We then also had specific mechanistic searches for certain um, pieces of information. For example, we had a separate search on inflammation and immune events um, that might be associated with multiple uh, portal of entry or systemic effects relating to, to immune modulation. And so that was a separate search from the health effects specific searches. Uh, similarly for, for genotoxicity and stuff like that with cancer um, was the way we pulled in the mechanistic information uh, was kind of in that focused manner through those focused health, uh, health non-health effects specific searches when it was not pretty much not developmental and repro and not, not um, uh, nervous system. They were all pulled in through these other searches. And I, sorry, sorry, sorry. Keep going. Please. <laughs> and so we did, there were subsets of mechanisms so to move on from listers. So that was the listers to move on from that. There were subsets of mechanistic information that were determined to be more potentially impactful, I guess you would, based on, again, that NAS 2011 report, as well as what the uncertainties were with the, the health effects specific searches. So we did conduct um, some more detailed evaluations of certain types of mechanistic studies, for example, studies um, relating to the to the mechanisms for cancer, in particular genotoxicity, had a very focused um, study evaluation focus on those, similar to the studies on the inflammation and immune effects had um, kind of a, a more thorough study evaluation approach applied to those studies that might be more impactful to understanding, you know, the role of immune cell modulation in some of these health effects. So there were some focused areas where we dove deeper on mechanism than I think um, in, in, than in other areas. Okay, thank you. The other um, questions? See? Yeah. yeah, I guess I'll ask another question. Um, on the various uh, evaluate, study evaluation tables, like I'm looking at table A-34, which is the sensory one, that's on uh, page 281 of the PDF. Um, you have these very helpful confidence uh, uh, graphs on the right-hand side uh, with colors on them for the various biases and so on, or absence of color if you didn't have a concern. And um, uh, it can, uh, would you say there's a direct mapping between um, how those, like how the coloring, um, you know, how much color, how many are colored and the final evaluation. Um, I, I know there was in somewhere else, either it was the beginning of the appendix or in the preface somewhere, there was a whole description of those and it gave some examples, but it didn't go through all the possible combinations of what we see in the results. So. Sure. Happy to take that. So the colors are um, just to distinguish one uh, domain from another. Uh, they don't have any actual meaning, um, but just to keep them separate. Um, if there's no color, there's considered to be uh, no bias um, from in that domain. If there is, um, and there's, you could think of it as with a line um, down the middle of it. And if the shading is below that line, that's indicating that we think that there's some bias towards the null in that way. If it's uh, equally above and below, um, they would say that the magnitude is maybe small, but we couldn't tell the direction. Um, and if it's all on the upper side, then we think there's probably bias away from the null there. And if the whole thing is shaded? Um, if the whole thing is shaded, um, we really have very little confidence in it. There could be confounding of which magnitude and direction uh, we can't ascertain, or the sample size could be very small, and um, we, we're not sure um, how purpose, what direction. Yeah, uh, following along from Leanne. So if any one box is colored, um, regardless of the direction, um, how would you uh, identify that as medium high? So if one box was colored, and but it was only sort of a halfway, not the whole way, um, that would be considered um, 
it might drop it down to a medium for, for just one. Sometimes there could be two if they're considered slight um, potential biases. Um, if it was the whole thing um, and there were multiple domains that were colored, then um, it might be um, uninformative. We just couldn't say. And in between, there could be low. Um, and we tried to summarize that in the rightmost column. We listed what we thought were the most influential issues for that study across those domains and tried to give it a um, little context there. So clarifying, does can one conclude that if you didn't mention one of the categories in the right-hand section, that that implies that you had a high confidence in that, or just that the what you wrote down was what drove your judgment? Is that that would be the other way of like it didn't necessarily say anything about the other categories. I would say we didn't think it was influential as a bias, not necessarily that they were all high, but there was nothing to indicate that um, it, it should be uh, diminished in, in our confidence. So for table one, for the sensory irritation, not table one, sorry, just give me, uh, table one, one, uh, for the sensory irritation uh, studies, and controlled exposure, um, those boxes were not there. Does that mean anything or in the main document? Excuse us while we sort of find table. Page uh, exactly, Main document 116. Yeah. So, as Andrew mentioned, um, the the different endpoints were handled somewhat differently. So earlier we were talking about um, the the cancer studies and others, and this is the controlled human study, which were done a little bit differently. Yeah, so for the controlled human exposure studies, there were, <clears throat> excuse me, there were considerations relating to um, some of the, the individual SB, IB, information bias, <laughs> selection bias, confounding, and other, um, not documented in the same way, you're right, but those were also considered in the appendix tables, but the one of the main um, evaluation points there was the controlled exposure itself, so that was separately evaluated in A51. Um, like we had talked about. And so the controlled human exposure studies would have undergone the same um, exposure quality evaluation as the animal studies were in terms of, you know, test article, generation method, analytical method, and things like that that were also very important. Um, and then there also is a section, like for sensory irritation, there's a section called methodological considerations for evaluating the studies in the beginning of each synthesis section. And that talks about some of the things important to, uh, I believe so, I'm not looking at right the second, but some of the important things to interpreting uh, the controlled exposure studies in the context of that that particular endpoint, because those studies were available there. Um, but again, it's the same uh, basic presentation that the primary limitations should still be limited in that table, even though it doesn't have that. I think you're you're looking for that graphic with the colors uh, that may not be there, but it's still the same thing where the the main limitations and the confidence are, are presented there. And again, confidence, high confidence would be few or no limitations within domains, medium confidence. There are some limitations, but they're not expected to substantially impact the results. And then low confidence, like Tom was saying, would be one or more. It could be a single thing that's wrong, um, kind of major limitations within a domain that reduce the confidence in the results or their interpretability. And then uninformative is just too much going on to really say much about the results. Uh, so that was consistent, but yeah, that, that caterpillar may not be there for the controlled exposure studies. Um, you're right. Uh, and ep the epidemiologist in me is asking this question, selection bias we always worry about, and it's always mystically possible. Um, how did you decide what the directional consequences of selection bias might be? I mean, I, I think it's arguably possible that selection bias could drive things in one direction or another, depending on the factors that underlie it. but. It's a, it's a hard determination 
to make. So how did you do that in practice? Um, in practice, we looked at the participation rates. If they were um, high, um, then it was unlikely to be related to the exposure. Um, if uh, participation rates were low, uh, then we considered there was potential uh, selection bias. And then we would look to see what information there was uh, that might relate uh, whether cases and controls were providing different uh, levels of information. Um, if in the cancer studies where we had cohorts, um, we looked at sort of, uh, I believe it was all cancer SMRs, uh, when those were very low, less than uh, an SMR of 70, then uh, we'd say that this looks like a very healthy population because uh, compared to the rest of the uh, population, they're not getting cancer. Um, that might concern us. Um, so those were some of the things that we did lay out in the A59 uh, section where we talked about cancer and uh, selection bias. In, in, in practice for selection bias, and you know, perhaps confounding is another, potential confounding is another example that you standardize the approach across health outcomes in some way so that each group had the same sort of operational approaches to deciding about the presence of potential presence of confounding selection bias and the consequences thereof. So the general strategy with confounding was to pre-identify what the potential confounders might be, what, what the other known causes of in a particular outcome might be, and to list those up front and look for those when we reviewed each of the studies. Um, so if it was uh, myeloid leukemia, we, we would look uh, we would uh, look at benzene and we would uh, make sure whether benzene was likely to be a potential confounder in this environment of that study. If it was, how was it addressed uh, in in the analysis? And, and the same tack was taken uh, throughout the, out, the other outcomes to sort of understand um, for that particular, like for asthma in the in the expert consultation, uh, we would have asked, you know, what are the other exposures that we need to be aware of uh, when we review these studies and which ones are uh, more important or less important and take that information. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Following on to the question on participation rate on and high or low, was there any cutoff that you used and or was that used uniformly across say all epi studies? I mean, there are general remarks that across most of the studies, the participation rates were above 90%. And when they were both all above 90%, we didn't consider this to be um, a vulnerability for selection bias. Uh, when those rates uh, dropped down to 70% uh, or lower, we became very concerned. Um, those sort of general rubrics were, were used across the studies because the epidemiologists were uh, convening and answering these questions and polling the group and then applying them. Um, so we, we had four epidemiologists on the team. So we were able to get good information that way. So I guess I'd answer, personally, you maybe answered a question I was asking. So it sounds like these study quality criteria were being developed <laughs> while you were evaluating studies as opposed to having them defined a priori and then applying them. Is that correct? They were honed over time, yes. And there were times where we went back and said, uh, we have to re you know, look at these again because now we're seeing it in a different light or there's something new that's come, come to mind or some new information. Do we have? Sorry, I was... Oh, I'm sorry, but hang on one second, Leah. Okay. Um, so I have a, a quick follow on too. So uh, what if no information, uh, for example, no information about participation rates is provided? Like, how would you deal with those kinds of situations where they just didn't tell you? And it's kind of true too of a lot of like, they just, you know, papers sometimes just don't report some crucial bit of information. So how did you deal with those kinds of situations? So when there's information that we're looking for, we're looking for it across all the studies and we don't find it in the study, um, that would be a concern, um, and possibly we would have um, considered that a potential for bias since we just don't know. And there were situations where we did reach out to study authors for additional information if it was, you know, a decision between a 
medium confidence and low confidence for you know what could be a critical study or something like that. Um, we didn't do it every time, as I think you have seen in our answers, but there were situations where we'd reach out to the study authors and if they didn't respond, then you know it's kind of you have to ding them, but um, sometimes we did get a response that helped clarify some of that information. Thank you. Just to uh, follow up, just um, you know, sometimes there might be, uh, they might not mention a potential confounder that we're interested in, and then we would have to consider what is the nature of the, the business or the exposure or the manufacturing process. Um, and is it really likely that uh, radiation is used in a, in a uh, formaldehyde resin plant? Probably not, and we would then we would set that aside. Ilian, back to you. Hi. Um, <clears throat> this this is a question about those response assessment and uh, calculation of RFC. I appreciate the fact that EPA now selects a number of finalist studies and are uh, calculating RFC and doing those response assessment then pick up one among them. But I'm not, not always, it's not always clear to me whether um, a number of IFCs actually inform your final selection versus you already have a study that you prefer the calculation of IFCs among a number of studies reinforces your choice. So that is my confusion. I wonder if you could collapse clarify whether you always have an algorithm which informs you how to choose the final one among a small set of studies. For example, whether you always choose the one with the lowest RFC. That, does the question, is the question clear? Yes, we would not always choose the one with the lowest R. So if you see in the, from I was trying to get to the figure that illustrates it. Um, which again is unfortunately taking too long on this computer right now. Um, so we had a number of candidate values across the different health effects, some of which were based on one or more studies that we had modeled um, for the different health effects. And there is a graphic that shows um, confidence in that, that candidate value based on consideration of the study underlying it. So was it a, a good quality study based on our evaluations? Um, the point of departure for estimating it, you know, do we have to extrapolate well below the doses that were examined or the exposure levels that were examined in the study, as well as um, the uncertainty that was applied to that uh, point of departure to derive the candidate value. So there's a graphic that shows um, kind of those confidence determinations, as well as the final candidate values, as well as the uncertainty. I, I'm not, and I don't have it open right now. I don't know if you can yeah. get it while I'm talking about it. But those would be the considerations that we applied to selecting that final number. So it was obviously not in that graphic, there are numbers that are much lower candidate values. I think there's a, a candidate value for male reproductive toxicity that's an order of magnitude lower. Um, however, the confidence in that candidate value was, was quite low and the uncertainty applied to derive that candidate value was quite high. Um, and so we had a lot more confidence in these human studies uh, on a collection of endpoints that all clustered very closely together with uncertainty factors on the order of three to 10, which uh, in our assessment practice is phenomenally low. Um, and so we went with the higher confidence candidate values with interpreted with, with, with less uncertainty and, and greater confidence, more so than so an to, actual level. Sorry, go ahead. Great. Uh, to follow on this, uh, thanks for that. But do you have a well-documented algorithm that tells you, say, step one, I do this, you know, choosing the when with the highest confidence, step two, so is the algorithm well documented versus it's a expert judgment case by case situation, more of a fuzzy but expert algorithm? Um, a lot of expert judgment is implied. We could have a very high quality cancer study and a medium quality cancer study, but the high quality, high confidence study could be at very high exposures and an occupational exposure. And what we're trying to do is estimate what uh, risks might be at the low exposures. So it might be a case that a medium uh, confidence study would be preferred over high because it allows us to estimate the risk in the low dose range where, where that's where we're interested and would require less uh, extrapolation to the low levels. So it's a balancing of, of these. Um, we're, we're obviously considering the quality, but we're also considering the range of the exposures. We're considering um, potential dose response as uh, one study only has linear, one actually looked at nonlinear. 
um, that might be important. And we're weighing those factors with expert judgment. Is this well documented in your documentation? I guess that's my, my final question. Can I, can I find it? all these rationales somewhere in the documentation, at least I have an understanding of that. So, so figure two, three is the figure I was talking about. And there is a discussion of those different aspects um, of confidence there. And that has actually been expanded upon in the Iris handbook that was finalized in 2022. It gives a little more explicit detail on you know, the <coughs> considerations of confidence uh, that go into determining which candidate value is most appropriate for, I think you're asking about the RFC uh, to, to represent the RFC. It's not algorithmic, so it's not you know one, then the next, then the next, but these are the considerations that are applied to making that judgment call on which value is most appropriate. So it's not an algorithmic approach, which I think is, is more what you're asking. It's not you know an average or anything like that. Maybe in, yeah. in practice, um, and Yvonne will go to you next, the, um, who was actually making this, this, these decisions about which study to pick? Was it the same group or was it the outcome specific groups who were determining within outcomes i guess i'm trying to understand if some uniformity was brought to the expert judgment for the selection uh this would have been a whole team decision so it would have been across all the disciplinary experts um and we also would have had our work group reviews we also have senior level reviews of all of our decisions we had at that time I think it was called cast a chemical assessment support team uh, that was senior level reviewers that would weigh in on those decisions also um, as well as during agency and interagency review the the, the kind of are, are we making the right selection would also be vetted through that uh, but it was not an individual it would have been the team that initially made this decision on you know we have the highest confidence in this value for these reasons uh, and then it was looked at sort of going up what you're and, and this is Chris, and that's similar to now where you have a team, they consult with the working groups. And then again, before it even leaves the division, you go through the senior level division review. And if I could follow on, I mean, the figure 2-2 two, two, um, that Andrew was talking about, it plots the, uh, the sort of organ specific RFCs against the composite uncertainty. Um, and in the graph, there are uh, pulmonary function studies, allergy studies, sensory irritation, respiratory tract pathology, asthma, female reproductive, um, and uh, male reproductive. And some of these are, I think, animal studies. So we really need the whole team who have the expertise across all of these endpoints um, to look across and put up there. And the footnote to figure two, two explains the, that. Yvonne? Yeah, just to stay on the um, dose response assessment, uh, can you tell us, um, you know, what's your current practice versus what was applied in this assessment with respect to uh, deriving a point estimate for the non cancer RFC versus a range of values? Because you've shown graphically that there's a clustering of studies and you've derived multiple candidate values and then organ specific values, but ultimately there's one number as opposed to the range. So what is the, um, again, the guidance that you use to derive a point estimate versus a range and then what's in the handbook? So how you, as, as an agency thinking about communicating that there is a range rather than a point estimate? So in the definition of the RFC, it does say with an uncertainty expanding perhaps in order of magnitude. However, we do provide point estimates because ranges are hard to use by our program and regional partners in application. Um, you know, do you choose the high end of the range? Do you choose the low end of the range? That's another decision point that they would have to make as a risk manager that uh, would be difficult. I, I think part of what you're asking, though, is in the handbook, there is also, you know, some discourse about you know risk specific doses and things like that moving beyond point estimates into things that that more perhaps better capture uncertainty and variability in a quantitative way. Um, so we're still exploring those avenues. Um, we've not, we have one assessment that's kind of piloting it. I don't know, Chris, if you want to talk about mm -hmm. that at this point, but we don't have any assessments that actually have applied it formally to, you know, from, from kind of nuts to bolts from start to finish. I don't think we need to get into, okay. you know, what what's outside of the scope of today's discussion, but just to summarize that it's, agency's practice and a long-standing practice to derive a point assess a uh, point estimate but you did provide the uh, all of the other candidates in accord with the recommendations of the 2011 committee correct and the previous tetrachloroethylene to you know to derive can multiple candidate rfcs 
Yeah, and even our candidate. So we have, so, so Tom mentioned organ specific values and those actually might be representative of one or more candidate toxicity values, which would be an individual study. We actually would have, you know, I think for some of those we have multiple endpoints within a study on the same health effect that were advanced as a candidate value and then another study. And then across those two or three candidate values selecting an organ specific that represents those two or three. And that is very consistent. There's a graphic in the NAS 2011 report that walks through, you know, study endpoint, you know, point of departure, I think we would call it a candidate value at this point, and then selecting, we have organ specific values, which are, we have been told are very useful for our partners that might be thinking about things like cumulative risk scenarios or cleanup actions that might be combining numbers for a certain health effect across chemicals, if you would. Um, and then the overall RFC that builds from that. But yeah, it's, there's a graphic in the AS2011 report that we followed pretty much exactly in terms of thinking about how to lay out a dose response uh, assessment in a logical and transparent way. Other um, questions? Anybody on remote with questions? Ah, Lauren. Yeah, um, appreciate hearing about your internal process in response to the previous question. Do you have that laid out in the document anywhere in the assessment? You're asking about the, the graphic that follows the NAS 2011? Or no, about your internal review process, the uh, way in which individual work groups might meet, discuss about a chemical expert work groups, and so forth. No, I don't think that's in the formaldehyde draft assessment materials themselves. That is probably in the handbook, but it's some to some extent. But no, those processes are not laid out in that way. Thank you. Others? So let me just ask a question. This is just John Samet asking a question now. Uh, I'm curious about the language you're now using for the strength of evidence for causation and, and why you change. I and mean, there's been a lot of standard practice. We've gone to evidence demonstrates, et cetera. I'm just sort of curious about the, about the motivation because it's a bit of a departure from many things I've worked on like Surgeon General's reports and other classifications of strength of evidence. And when I read it, it still sort of has a mental grading that, um, and so why'd you do it? Um, so there's a long story between behind the evidence integration processes that we piloted a, a, a number of different um, terms to describe the different categories or strengths of evidence for, for um, hazard, if you would. Um, we had a lot of internal discussions with our program partners across the agency on this. We had convened work groups with the different um, programs and regions to discuss this, and there was a lot of emphasis from those programs on making the conclusion about the evidence and not about something other than the evidence. So that's why it's about, you know, does the evidence demonstrate it rather than do I have high confidence in the evidence or something like that was, was something that came across pretty strongly from our agency partners. But I don't know if there's, um, we tried a number of iterations, <laughs> I guess is the way to say that. And, um, you know, we tried frameworks that exist within the EPA um, and those didn't fly for our, for our program. We had those discussions. So this is where we landed after some some discussions and just to maybe this is Chris just elaborate a little bit because you're talking about across the agency so you can have various opinions across the agency and so what worked for some parts of the agency didn't work for others and so what you're seeing now is something that was okay we can agree go <laughs> so that's that's essentially how how we got there but as Andrew indicated a variety of scenarios were were floated and discussed or so um yeah, and just to follow up, these were reviewed as part of the review of the IRIS handbook, or how how were these yeah, designation these, reviewed? These were discussions in the context of developing the IRIS handbook. So this would have been discussions that were happening in 2016, thereabouts, um, led by you know core members of the IRIS handbook development team with you know agency representatives from the different programs and regions um, that happened over. It was it was a long period of time. <laughs> a lot of because we would try something. Uh, we, you know, we had the, anyway, it was, it was a, a number of discussions in the context of developing the IRIS handbook, not the format assessment specifically. Yeah, I mean, another concern that we have is the way that the EPA had previously treated um, hazard determinations for cancer versus non-cancer. And there was a uh, considered, it would be very useful if we could standardize the descriptors across cancer and non-cancer, so they would be much more similar than they were previously. 
they're not descriptors, so just want to. Okay, thank you. I'm sure we could have a long discussion about this, but uh, I will curb my tongue and, uh, and we won't go on. But let me ask about um, just, you know, we do have time left on the schedule, just if there's anything else. And, and again, we're, you know, I think we have perhaps not so many questions because you did such a good job of um, <laughs> responding to uh, the questions that we posed to you. But let me just check with the committee and see if anybody else has any uh, questions or comments or anybody online. So what would you like to do with scheduling? We, we could just go ahead. Can we go ahead with the public? Yeah. Or do you want to have a 10 minute break or people here? Up to you. Let's see. Um, I think we're scheduled otherwise at 320. Right? Yeah. Ish. Ish. So why don't we take a 10 minute break so, so we can. So I think what we'll do, and, and again, I want to thank our colleagues at EPA again for uh, the very useful um, responses to our questions and for coming and speaking with us today. And I think what we'll do since we're scheduled at 320, we're continuing on with public comments. We'll wait 10 minutes to just make sure that everybody is gathered. So uh, why don't we take a break for 10 minutes and then we'll come back. Thanks. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, resume and move to our uh, public comment uh, period. I'd like to now recognize those who registered in advance to make brief comments to the committee. We have had invited comments from uh, one speaker per, we have invited comments from one speaker per organization and we'll recognize those individuals and organizations who have not previously addressed the um, committee. Each speaker listed on the slide will have a maximum time of three minutes to provide comments relevant to the committee's uh, task. Uh, after the meeting, anyone who wishes to submit written comments or other materials that are relevant to our charge should submit them via the National Academies um, project um, page. As a reminder, um, each uh, presenter is limited to three minutes. We have a substantial number of people who do want to offer comments um, to the uh, committee, and we will give you a warning uh, as you approach the end of your um, allocated um, time. So with that, if we can go to the list of um, commenters. Down, okay. Down here, down here. Okay, uh, all right. First, we will go with um, Preston uh, Beard. If you're here, we're ready for you to um, go ahead and get started. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great. Good afternoon. My name is Preston Beard. And on behalf of the United States Chamber of Commerce, we appreciate the opportunity to comment on the draft iris review of formaldehyde issued by the EPA. The Chamber and its members are committed to safe and responsible management of all chemicals, including formaldehyde, and look forward to continued co cooperation with the EPA on ensuring the protection of public health, beginning with the development of a complete and foundational risk information that is at the heart of the IRIS program. Formaldehyde is an important chemical with beneficial uses spanning a broad range of economic sectors. Given the potential, potential for IRIS assessments to trigger litigation and regulatory impacts on business, it is critical to ensure the draft assessments is, are informed by the best available science and developed through a transparent and unbiased process that, is appro that appropriately and integrates all streams of evidence. Unfortunately, we have concerns that this standard was not met. These concerns are not new to IRIS and in fact appear to reflect a continuation of longstanding problems inherent in the broader IRIS program. Over the course of the last decade, a series of reports have criticized IRIS for lack of transparency, improper scientific processes, and inconsistent and flawed methodologies. Beyond just formaldehyde and the IRIS program, this approach also sets a troubling precedent for other risk assessments that EPA may undertake for chemicals and pollutants under the TSCA, Pesticide Registration, and the Clean Air Act. We therefore strongly urge EPA to address these shortcomings in a rigorous and impartial manner while using the best available science consistent with the 2016 Lautenberg Amendments to TSCA and other statutes. In light of these concerns, the Chamber urges EPA to take the necessary time to follow updated IRIS process and 
to follow updated hours process and fully incorporate comments from all relevant stakeholders to issue a revised draft and ensure that any final assessment is transparent, scientifically sound, and adheres to statutory intent. Moreover, because EPA failed to incorporate fundamental concerns about key issues during the interagency and intraagency review process, the agency therefore should coordinate with OMB to conduct a formal interagency review of draft formaldehyde iris assessment that facilitates review and comment from experts and agencies familiar with the use of formaldehyde across the country. In closing, the chamber believes that this approach sets a troubling precedent for other chemical risks assessments, and we strongly encourage EPA to revise the, the draft assessment and incorporate the best available science and practices for systematic review. A formaldehyde iris assessment that does not consider the weight of scientific evidence could lead to unwarranted regulations that would ripple through the supply chain. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and we'll now move on to uh, to Kesha Collins Wright. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi, I am Vice President of Environmental Affairs for the Louisiana Chemical Association. Um, LCA is a nonprofit Louisiana corporation with over 100 chemical manufacturing sites in Louisiana. Um, in April of last year, EPA released its draft iris assessment for formaldehyde. Based on the voluminous set of documents, LCA requested that EPA extend the comment period on the review for at least 60 days. Notably, many other industrial and commercial entities made similar requests, which really demonstrated the universal need for more time to review and to fully digest the documents. Um, unfortunately, however, EPA denied those requests. Um, LCA considers the 60-day public comment period to have been woefully inadequate to allow for a thorough review of the documents, let, a note, let alone enough time to prepare informed and complete comments for EPA's review. The comment period allowed for only really a preliminary review and commentary and thus undermines the transparency of and confidence in EPA's review process. Um, LCA retained an outside toxicologist to review the documents. And during her review, she made several findings. Um, and in the interest of time today, I won't go into great detail about all of her findings. Obviously, you can find that in the comments we submitted to the docket. However, among other issues, uh, she found that EPA overestimated the relationship between exposure or formaldehyde and the incidence of, can of cancer such as nasal pharyngeal cancer and sinonasal cancers and myeloid leukemia, finding evidence demonstrates, quote unquote, a relationship between exposure and those cancers. Instead, based on EPA guidelines, we find the classifications of evidence indicates, quote unquote, and evidence supports is more appropriate here. The draft, the draft assessment concludes that human exposure to formaldehyde at extremely low doses causes a variety of adverse health effects. However, these conclusions are based on very little new evidence and are not scientifically supported. LCA appreciates the opportunity to discuss these issues today and hopes that the agency will review all of the work done by and information provided okay, by all the commenters who have concerns about the review process and that the agency makes meaningful changes to the risk assessment to incorporate the new research and data that challenges aspects of the draft assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on now to uh, Guillermo Grebermariam. Please go ahead. Doesn't look like they're there. So we'll move on to the next person. Okay, then uh, we'll move on uh, to Adrian uh, Krigsman, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. I apologize. I'm so sorry. You can speak now. Hello. My name is Adrian Kreitzman, and I'm speaking on behalf of Troy Corporation and Arxata Company. Troy Corporation is a manufacturer of preservatives for industrial processes such as the manufacture of paints and coatings, 
construction products, and metalworking fluids. These are regulated under the Office of Pesticide Programs, the Antimicrobial Division under FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Redenticide Act. And many of these preservative active ingredients are now undergoing a periodic reevaluation of toxicology data and assessment of risks, risks by OPP under their reg review program. Some of our preservative products have been determined to be formaldehyde donor chemistries since their primary mode of action uh, of antimicrobial action is through the release of formaldehyde into the test article. We would like to highlight the importance of the draft formaldehyde assessment in the review of these products, as well as the interaction of OPP with the Office of Toxic Substances within the Reg Review Program. Um, highlighting the importance of the draft risk assessment on formaldehyde, as in 2011, OPP proposed to use the IRIS formaldehyde assessment as the basis of regulation of formaldehyde donor pesticides under their then what they called RED program. Since that time, EPA has proceeded with their reg review program, a 15-year cyclic approach towards the upgrading of pesticide active ingredients. And within the past year, OPP staff have indicated their collaboration with the toxic offices staff on the 2020 draft formaldehyde risk assessment, and again reiterated their intent to await the finalization of this assessment uh, as part of their overall use in their reg review program. Um, the evaluation of the 2022 draft risk assessment must be conducted using the best available science and review of various key parameters of formaldehyde toxicology, such as the mode of action, linear versus nonlinear approach, and overall exposure because of the downstream effects on such other regulations such as FIFRA and the reg review program. Um, Moving on to formaldehyde assessment to a particular seconds. type of uh, uh, approach for metalworking fluids. Um, formaldehyde donor chemistry pesticides are used to preserve metalworking fluids for microbial attack. Uh, besides providing microbial control, this class of preservatives also provides added benefit of combating various endotoxins associated with metalworking fluid spray mist. These endotoxins are known to have an effect on respiratory function of workers within that environment. If OPP determines the end result is the cancellation of this class of preservatives in this. Um, I'm sorry that uh, we ran out of time, but I, th I think you got to the main points. Thank you. Um, next is um, Mary uh, Mirabeau. Please go ahead. Next is uh, Brock Landry. I'm uh, sorry, I missed. I'm sorry. Sorry, Brock. Um, next is Brock uh, Landry. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name was added to the list in error. I don't have any comments for you at this time. Okay, then we'll go on to uh, Mary Maribo. Does not look like she is here. So uh, we'll move on to Peggy. Okay. Uh, Peggy Murray uh, will be next, and we will circle back and check on those who weren't here. But uh, okay. am I unmuted? Please go ahead. You're, yes, I you're fine. We can hear you. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Peggy Murray. I'm the uh, research director for the Center for Truth and Science, which is a private nonprofit organization with a mission to ensure that only the best science is used in policy and legal decisions. In their April draft assessment that they released, the EPA directly linked exposure to inhaled formaldehyde with myeloid leukemia and other LHP cancers and concluded that the relationship was causal or is causal. And in, in contrast, the most recent US to National Toxicology Program report did not make claims of causality, but only suggested an asso association. Uh, and a number of scientific experts have questioned EPA's conclusion on, on leukemia and inhaled formaldehyde. And that's based on an insufficiency of causal evidence, including the absence of mechanistic plausibility. So after an initial examination of the EPA literature review process, the center determined that an independent rigorous review of studies utilizing currently the currently most advanced systematic review methods is needed for optimal development of policy and prevention. Uh, so we 
a focus on the fact that new, new studies would need to include epidemiological analyses, relevant animal studies, basic mechanistic investigations, and studies of contribution to cancer risk that can be attributed to the additive effects of endogenous formaldehyde. Uh, so we released an RFP in, on December 1st in 2022. It closes this Wednesday, February 1st. We expect that the uh, awards will be made pretty quickly after an independent review and that the work will be completed and submitted for publication by this fall. Um, we hope to determine the extent to which there is scientific evidence for a clear causal link between exposure to inhaled leukemia and uh, LHP cancers. Uh, we want to see accepted state-of-the-art systematic review methods, including uh, the opportunity to uh, replicate the review. So we're asking that applicants include a plan for publication that includes uh, uh, allowing the transparency necessary for others to run the same analyses in order to determine replicability of results. So this is kind of a new approach to systematic reviews. Paul Tugwell in 2020 published on this, and we, we think it's a good idea. Um, so... We expect the findings to be published in the fall. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk about it. And we'll certainly be willing to share those findings with everyone. Uh, thank you. And now we'll move on to Frederick uh, Nandu. Uh, Frederick? Does not look like they're here. So we'll move on to Andy O'Hare. I'll move on to um, Andy O'Hare. If you're here, please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Andy O'Hare, and I am president of the Composite Panel Association, or CPA. I am pleased to provide you with the perspectives of CPA on the 2022 draft from Aldehyde Iris Assessment. CPA was founded in 1960 and is a trade association representing more than 95% of the North American manufacturers of particle board, medium density fiber board, and hardboard. The total impact of the industry on the U.S. economy is almost $10 billion annually. The industry directly supports over 23,000 well-paying jobs. These products are produced using wood fiber that would otherwise be landfilled or decay in the environment. The fiber is generally sourced from sawmills and tree harvesting operations. The panels are produced by uh, combining the fiber with resins, followed by pressing and sizing in composite panel mills. The panels are key ingredients in long-lived products, ubiquitous in residential and commercial buildings, including cabinets, furniture, and flooring. Most resin systems employed in the panel making process contain formaldehyde as a key ingredient. Consequently, CPA is very interested in the IRS assessment and its potential impact on policies impacting formaldehyde use. The formaldehyde emissions from these products is very highly regulated. In 2010, Congress passed an amendment to the Toxic Substances Control Act called the Formaldehyde Standards for Composite Wood Products Act. We had support from national environmental groups and we were instrumental in passage of this law. With President Obama's signature, EPA prepared an implementing proposed rule in 2013. A final rule was issued in 2016. The rule established very low limits for emissions of formaldehyde from composite wood products to protect human health and the environment. The formaldehyde resins used to make these products are important contributors to the successful product performance. The availability of these versatile and cost-effective wood products would be significantly impacted by a TOSCA rule limiting the use of formaldehyde resins. Indeed, the EPA rule is a risk management tool supported by a rigorous independent third-party testing and certification program. CPA strongly, strongly believes that the EPA rule is the type of common sense approaches Congress envisioned when TOSCA was amended in 2016. The extremely low proposed risk level suggested by the 2002 draft EPA IRIS assessment are well below formaldehyde concentrations in the environment. Their potential reflection in a TOSCA risk assessment could eliminate this and perhaps many other very useful applications of formaldehyde. Thank you for your attention to our views, and I would be happy to address any questions you may have. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go on now to uh, Leslie Recio. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. All right, so um, my name is, I'm Leslie Recio. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Cytovation. I recently reviewed the US EPA review on formaldehyde, and I think there was a misinterpretation, misinterpretation of a manuscript that I was a senior author on. In a study conducted at CIT, we observed PP3 homozygous single base substitution point mutations in the rat nasal squamous cell carcinomas from formaldehyde exposed rat. This reduction to homozygosity at the P53 locus for point mutations observed indicates that either the other P53 allele was silenced or had been deleted, or there was a gene conversion recombinational event, or there was an aneuploidy event of the other allele rendering uh, now homozygosity for a single base point mutation in the cDNA. A particular concern to me is that this is, is used as, as a misinterpretation of a genotoxic mode of action. And this is not plausible for a number of reasons. For one thing, these were homozygous point mutations in the identical location. So having a, a mutagenic target that those two base pairs specifically in both alleles is not plausible. The DNA protein crosslinks that form the primary lesion of, DNA, of formaldehyde exposure is not an addict that produces point mutations exclusively at GC base pairs. A separate study by the NTP showed in P53 heterozygote mice concluded that the results of this short-term carcinogenicity study do not support a role for P53 in formaldehyde-induced neoplasia. In that study, there was no observance or increase of leukemias or lymphohematopoietic cancers. To conclude, the P53 mutations we observed were likely due to a passenger kind of event, not a mutagenic event induced by formaldehyde. And finally, there, there's no data to support a role for formaldehyde-induced P53 mutations and formaldehyde-induced neoplasia, either nasal cancers or hematopoietic cancers. That's it. Okay, um, thank you, committee. Questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on then to uh, David uh, Saldmiras, please. Uh, Lindsay Russo is next. Oh, just kidding. Yeah. Uh, then... David. David yielded time, so we will move on to Li Yang. Okay, then uh, we're moving to uh, Li Yang uh, next. Uh, please go ahead. Let's see, is Li on? Li on and asked on mute. Let's see, um, Li Yang, if you're ready, you can go ahead, please. And then we'll move on to Elva. Okay, and um, uh, Li will circle back to you in case you're having problems. Then to uh, Elvis Zornick, please. Here, give us a moment here. Uh, then we'll talk to Charlotte Anthony. Okay, um, Charlotte Anthony, if you're on, please uh, go ahead. We'll... Sorry, I wasn't registered to make oral comments. On to the next person. Okay, um, next to Harvey Clue. Harvey. Oh, there I go. Yeah, I can oh, hear you okay. now. Okay, we can. Yeah, we hear you now. Ah, Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Harvey Kluhl, and I'm a principal consultant at Rumble U.S. Consulting. Together with my colleague, Mel Anderson, I've been conducting research on the carcinogenicity of formaldehyde for more than 30 years. First for the Air Force, later at CIT and the Hamner, 
Much of this research has been funded by the American Chemistry Council. However, the opinions expressed today are my own. At the Hamner, we conducted studies on the dose response for genomic responses of the rat nasal epithelium to inhaled formaldehyde. These studies clearly demonstrated that effects of inhaled formaldehyde on cells only occur at concentrations that significantly increase cellular formaldehyde above endogenous levels, which requires inhaled concentrations of 6 ppm and above. Recently, my colleague Roy Connolly has made important improvements to the formaldehyde BBDR model to address perceived uncertainties, uncertainties and to incorporate an extended data set where both inhaled and endogenous and formaldehyde can form DNA addicts. In developing the current EPA cancer guidelines, the EPA under the leadership of Dr. Bill Farland pioneered a new approach for conducting cancer risk assessments that was anchored in the notion of a chemical's mode of action for carcinogenicity. The mode of action serves as the basis for the evaluation of toxicity studies and the selection of the most appropriate extrapolation approaches. To support science-based risk assessments under the EPA cancer guidelines, the principles of structured review must not only be applied to the selection of human and animal evidence of toxicity, but also to the evaluation of mechanistic evidence regarding the mode of action. The draft assessment's failure to incorporate a systematic review approach for reviewing and integrating mechanistic studies excludes this critical aspect of the risk assessment process and introduces substantial risk of error and bias into the assessment. A formal mode of action human relevance framework developed by the International Program on Chemical Safety, which is cited in EPA's cancer guidelines and the IRIS handbook, provides a structured framework for such evaluations. Two recent publish publications on which I am a co-author were able to apply this framework to the cancer endpoints for formaldehyde. I believe that the necessary mechanistic data for determining a mode of action for formaldehyde is available and that the structured review would support the conclusions of a recent international interdisciplinary expert workshop documented in Anderson et al. 2019 that the mode of action for rat nasal tumors is driven by cytotoxicity and proliferation with mutagenicity only contributing at exposure associated with toxicity, and that there is no plausible mode of action for inhaled formaldehyde to cause cancer in tissues other than the immediate portal of entry. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you. And next we'll move to Chris Farmer. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Farmer. I am general counsel for the National Funeral Directors Association, NFDA, and founder of the law firm, The Farmer Firm, here in Houston, Texas. I'm here today to speak on behalf of the members of NFDA. I have dedicated my 20-year legal practice to representing funeral service businesses in all aspects, including making sure that funeral service professionals have a safe and healthful place to work. Funeral service professionals are well-educated on the potential risks associated with formaldehyde. They are also extensively trained and equipped on how to use it safely. Formaldehyde remains the preferred preservative used in embalmings in the United States today and is unrivaled in its ability to safely ensure that remains are in a condition so that families are able to say goodbye to their loved ones. Today, I want to share my concerns with you regarding the EPA's 2022 draft formaldehyde assessment. First, the literature review of, that EPA conducted did not incorporate many aspects that are critical to executing a systematic review such as systematic review protocol, objective inclusion and exclusion criteria, and transparent methods and results for evidence integration and synthesis. These failures resulted in the exclusion of key studies that may have impacted the weight of evidence assessment and consequently could have changed EPA's decision-making. Second, in deriving the reference concentration, the EPA relied on a potentially flawed approach for selecting key studies. By prioritizing general population studies over controlled human exposure studies, they relied on studies that are subject to greater potential bias and confounding. Additionally, there exist significant limitations in the studies the EPA relied on to dictate key health effects that could impact conclusions on causality, including limitations on study design and interpretation of adversity for the selected endpoints. We ask that the academies reconsider the key studies and identified points of departure used to predict the RFC, as well as the weight of the evidence around conclusions made by the EPA. Finally, when deriving the inhalation unit risk value describing formaldehyde cancer potency, the EPA analysis had two major flaws. First, the EPA relied on a study for which potential confounding has been identified and reported on in the literature. 
some of the studies reporting on this confounding were not included in the EPA's assessment. Also, the EPA did not fully evaluate alternate modes of action and similarly excluded or disregarded key studies in their review. We encourage the academies to consider both of these fundamental issues when evaluating the EPA's assessment. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Next, we'll move to James Enstrom. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm Dr. James Enstrom, and I'm adding to my October 12th comments. I've had a long career as an environmental epidemiologist at UCLA, and I've published significant evidence that air pollution, particularly PM 2.5, does not cause deaths in the United States. I want to emphasize that EPA has not based its 2022 IRIS assessment on personal exposure to formaldehyde. Personal exposure must be used because people spend most of their time indoors where exposure levels are very low. In my Los Angeles office, my formaldehyde monitor reads between one and six micrograms per cubic meter. This level is below the EPA inhalation reference concentration for no human health effects of seven. Indeed, available human studies do not show health effects below 35 micrograms per cubic meter. Furthermore, the National Academy and EPA must recognize and quantify the extreme funding bias, publication bias, citation bias against null findings. I have fully documented these biases in PM 2.5 epidemiology, and I have evidence that the same is true for formaldehyde epidemiology. These biases distort all the findings in the IRIS assessment. One, one example of these biases is my independent reanalysis of the ACS CPS2 cohort, which found no relationship between PM 2.5 and total mortality. Yet the American Cancer Society officials will not confirm my findings and will not deal with transparency and reproducibility issues, which are fundamental aspects of the scientific method. And EPA did not cite my null findings as they are now proceeding to tighten the PM 2.5 NACs. Also, EPA has not focused on the evidence that there is no relationship between formaldehyde and total mortality and total cancer. Instead, EPA focuses on specific risks for minor cancers like nasopharyngeal cancer. Tragically, there is no compromise between scientists with different views. My major concern is regarding the loss of science in the United States. You must all watch the December 15 talk by at Stanford by renowned theoretical physicist Lawrence Krauss. The title is, Is Woke Science the Only Science Allowed in Academia? And also you must read the December 22nd article by David Strong entitled, The Sciences Are Going to Die. EPA's effort to continually tighten air regulations hurts science and hurts America. And this committee should rethink what EPA is doing. Thank you very much for your opportunity to speak. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And next we'll move on to um, Kun Lu. If you're on, please uh, go ahead. My name is Kun Lu, uh, a uh, professor from UNC Chapel here. I really appreciate the community to provide the multiple opportunity for me to provide the public comments to contribute to the science-based of American risk assessment. Over the past 15 years, so we have spent much effort to study the key issue related to formaldehyde carcinogenicity and risk assessment by developing the sensitive formaldehyde specific DNA duct and DNA protein crossing biomarkers, which build on our significant improved understanding of chemistry between formaldehyde and biological molecules such as DNA protein. I have previously provided detailed writing comments about the IRS formaldehyde draft. I will only focus on important issue today, formaldehyde's chemistry and its interaction with the proteins. Formaldehyde is one of the most extensive study chemical, but its chemistry and interaction with the biological molecule are quite complex. The IRS formaldehyde draft didn't develop adequate understanding and discussion of formaldehyde chemistry and its fit following exposure, which significantly impact our understanding of formaldehyde carcinogenicity and risk assessment, especially for low-dose exposure. 
In addition to its metabolism through the ADH3 pathway, formaldehyde as a highly reactive aldehyde actually rapidly reacts with other biological molecules, including DNA and protein, and especially proteins. The interaction between the formaldehyde and the protein has a significant, uh, uh, has an important implication about its fit and the carcinogenicity at a low dose exposure. For instance, we have previously demonstrated formaldehyde can rapidly target the protein uh, residue such as a lesson, and more importantly, such protein binding uh, limited the availability of formaldehyde to enter into the nucleus to cause the DNA damage. And uh, consistently in our uh, ultra low dose 28 state study, uh, we, were, we were not able to detect any inhaled formaldehyde induced DNA damage at 300 ppb, 30 ppb, and 1 ppb. In contrast, we confidently and uh, robustly detect the uh, inhaled formaldehyde induced uh, DNA damage in numerous uh, other uh, rodent acid as a dose of 0.7 ppm. So the, the reason uh, why we see such a dose dependent uh, formation of uh, uh, adduct formation point to a, a strong possibility that, that formaldehyde may have a, a, a stretch hold to induce impact and uh, damage. And uh, given the high activity of formaldehyde uh, uh, react with the protein, so the uh, formaldehyde binding with the extracellular protein and other abundant protein may limit the availability of formaldehyde to enter into the cell to cause damage and the mutagenesis and the carcinogenicity. So the, uh, this is represent a significant data gap the understanding for Mara has a low dose carcinogenicity, and uh, clearly the further uh, study is needed. And uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And um, we'll move now to uh, Heather Lynch. Hello, can Heather? you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Lynch. I'm a health scientist with Stantec. Thanks for the opportunity again to speak today. In the 10 years since the National Research Council's review of the 2010 draft formaldehyde iris assessment, EPA has been concurrently revising the formaldehyde assessment and overhauling the iris program to incorporate systematic review methods as requested by the NRC. The iris overhaul culminated in the release of the draft handbook for conducting iris reviews in 2020, which was just finalized in December of 2022. During the October 12th, 2022 public NASM committee meeting on the 2022 draft formaldehyde iris assessment, a member of the committee inquired about the timing of the draft development relative to the reforms made to the iris process. Doctors Kraft and Thayer confirmed the concurrent timeline indicating that the formaldehyde assessment was the quote, test bed for the iris handbook. During this discussion, Dr. Samet raised the question of whether the Cochrane Collaboration, one of the pioneers of systematic review, could provide insights into what should be done when new methodologies emerge during a review's often lengthy development. Indeed, the Cochrane Handbook recommends carefully considering evolving methods and best practices during the assessment, stating, quote, depending on the changes required, it may be appropriate to conduct a new review from scratch meeting current standards. If a new review is not needed, the Cochrane uh, Handbook indicates that newly available information must be appropriately incorporated into the review in the same manner and using the same methods as the initial body of study selected. Further, and perhaps more importantly, the Cochrane Handbook states that any changes to the methodology must be clearly documented. It's not entirely clear to what extent and when the new systematic review principles and methods were incorporated into the EPA's 2022 formaldehyde draft, but we do know that the draft was not restarted at any point in its 10-year development. Further, there was no systematic review protocol to document the changes. Finally, the 2022 draft clearly describes that different methods for literature search and selection were employed for the pre-2017 phase relative to the post-2021 phase of the IRIS draft development. Overall, while some of the methods now described in the handbook were clearly incorporated into the 2022 IRIS draft, it seems unlikely that the entire review given its start date in 2012, reflects current EPA approaches, or more importantly, current best practices for systematic review. Thus, okay. EPA's systematic review methodology should be carefully reviewed by the NASM committee. If this is to be a state of the science assessment that informs guidance and regulation at state and federal levels, at a minimum, a consistent and clearly described systematic review approach should be used to evaluate the evidence. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. And next we'll move to uh, James Sherman. Let's see, are you, is he here? Hello, my name is Jim Sherman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Sorry. Um, I'm a fellow in the toxicology and product stewardship team at Selenies. Previously, I described how the Nisi Masano et al. 2012 asthma study was misinterpreted in the draft assessment. Today, I'll focus on two other studies that were incorrectly advanced for the asthma endpoint. First, Ven et al. 2003 was not designed to investigate the induction of asthma or exacerbated asthma responses. The metric used was wheezing. There were a number of study design flaws, some previously recognized by NAS, that are detailed in the written comments I will submit to you. I'll get to my point here. The EPA reevaluated VEN to conclude that formaldehyde likely causes asthma and high confidence that formaldehyde exacerbates asthma control, as well as providing medium confidence at the, in the asthma POD. In contrast, Van et al. clearly stated in their manuscript, we saw no effect of formaldehyde on asthma risk. Such disconnects between what the peer-reviewed literature says and the determinations made in the draft assessment do not reflect good science. Secondly, there are a number of design flaws in the Krizanowski et al. 1990 study, some previously recognized by NAS, that were not recognized in the draft IRIS assessment such as small numbers of children in the two highest exposure bands, incomplete reporting, and the inherent weakness is in its cross-sectional design. I'd like to point out three critical points that I identified that were not previously recognized in the study. First, there was no dose response when asthma incidence was evaluated for all children, children exposed to ETS, or children not exposed to ETS. Secondly, although varying formaldehyde concentrations were characterized in the main room, the subject's bedroom, other bedrooms, and the kitchen. The only comparator concentration used was the kitchen concentration. As all parents know, children's age between 16 and 15 years old do not spend a significant amount of their day in the kitchen. So this singular comparison is not a, an appropriate comparator for judging cause and effect of a chronic disease in children. Thirdly, the analysis presented by Krizanowski included 301 children, although there were only 298 children in the study. When breaking out the children exposed to ETS versus those that were not, the number of children evaluated was 293 out of the 298 in the study. No explanation was provided for the extra or missing participants. Considering the low number of participants in the two higher exposure bands, the unexplained extra and missing participants in this analysis is quite concerning. Thanks for your service, and I hope these comments will be reflected in your peer review report. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, and what I'm going to do now is circle back through those who were not there on when we came to your names and see if you're you have joined now. So first was uh, Germa uh, Gabramariam. Are you on? There. Not. Okay. And Mary Maribo? No. No. And uh, Frederick Nundu. And let's see, Katie Stump. Nope. And Lee Yang. All knows. Okay. All right. Just doing due diligence here. Um, so I'd like to now draw this open session to a close. I um, want to thank those who joined for, uh, for comments from the uh, Public. I want to thank our EPA sponsors and our committee for this valuable uh, discussion. And thanks to all who uh, joined this information gathering session, as well as the National Academy's uh, staff. Uh, thank you all and goodbye.